posted the, the, the thing on your wall, and if, if everyone would do that when you when you say you're going to come, and also share it on your wall on Facebook, that gets the word out more. Okay, I'm real excited today to have uh, Alan Fadden uh, speak with us today. He, a couple of months ago, I met him and I read his book, Innovation on Demand. Um, I've often said that I felt like this, the, if you've ever read a book and you felt like, man, this, this book is written specifically for me. That's, that's the way that, yeah. I go buy it. We'll put this on par with the buy now. <laughs> yes. But you're not under no pressure. <laughs> but anyway, it was a, a, a very in, impactful on, on the way uh, some of the ideas that I've come up with. I'll just share real briefly uh, one of the principles that I uh, read in the book was introduced to and applied in my own business. He talks about using opposites. And I, I think I've shared this with, with some of you before. I have a Fast Science franchise, and there's 500 franchises in, in uh, the United States. And the difference between stores that are really successful, when I say really successful, they're generally doing over a million dollars a year in sales. Uh, between the, the stores that are doing a million dollars in sales and those that do the struggle to get by like me, doing $500,000 in sales, is having an outside sales rep, okay? The problem for me is I've been an outside sales most of my, well, my career as an outside sales rep. And I know how difficult it is to hire and train and find good people. Because what happens with an outside sales rep, you usually have to bring them in and you have to pay them a big subsidy and, and while they learn the business and then you send them out to make the money, you find out they're not so good and then you got to start all over again. But you've got all this money invested, and then, and then the, this doesn't work. So the idea that I, came, that I was uh, motivated by was the opposite. But instead of having one sales rep selling 500 signs, I wanted to try the idea of having 500 salespeople selling one sign. And the way that I did that is through an affiliate program, teaming up with graphic designers, giving them their own online sign catalog that they could sell to their clients as they're, des they're designing projects for. And then I, their, their uh, customers save money because the design work's already done, so I can give their customer a discount because the design work's done. And then I pay the, the graphic designer a commission on the sale. So I have, right now, uh, it's real short, it's a real small group, about 30 graphic designers selling signs for me. That's not 500, but I'm working on it. Now the first full month was last month where I started getting sales, and we, we were able to generate about $5,000 in sales as a result of that affiliate program. Yay. So it's on its way, you know, when I have 150 graphic designers, I'll let you know how it's going. But anyway, I wanted to thank Alan for the, putting, putting that idea into my life. Uh, I'm not. I'm not paying him any money. Either. He's not paying any money. So anyway, I'll turn the time over to Alan. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Robbie. What a great idea. Want to play a game? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. For money, I don't carry one dollar bills. I don't carry five dollar bills. I don't carry ten dollar bills. I don't carry twenty dollar bills. I don't carry fifty dollar bills. I don't carry one hundred dollar bills. I carry nothing but two dollar bills. Mm -hmm. So here's the here's the game. The question is this, why do I carry $2 bills? Now, there are no wrong answers here. Some are more elegant than others in terms of what I'm looking for, but there are no wrong answers, just as in creativity, and just as in your business. Now, the first hand up was back there. Yes, why do I carry two? Set you apart from other speakers. The only person I've ever seen is Set you apart. Now, let me ask you this, is that important? For you and your business to be set apart. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to show you some numbers on that about how important that is today. You know, as media gets more and more crowded, more and more cluttered, and we get everything starts looking the same. You Google something, like you think, oh, I'm really different. Well, I'm not, because I got two, you know, 200,000 hits just on my new idea. Oops. So, and as it gets more of the same, it gets more and more important to be different, and in fact, it's worth money for you. Not only just revenue, but margins, and I'll show you some of that. Great idea, yes? You're engaging the audience. Engaging the audience, and are we engaging? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> 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 no, we're, we're really <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You 
must not be from Minnesota. No. See, I'm originally from the Midwest, Minnesota. Because usually after the first or second one, they, the root of motion of the Midwest is guilt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have been saying, no, 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 that's too many twos. Yeah, sure, you betcha. <laughs> What's your idea? Why don't I carry two? Well, for one thing, uh, you always know when you've handed out a $2 bill and you see one floating, it's yours. Oh, that's right. You know, it, 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 thank you. It's like leaving your mark around. People come, come to me and say, Hey, man, I heard you speak 15 years ago at 3 a.m., and I still got my $2 bill. It's amazing how that works. In fact, the military base wanted to show their value. They are thinking about eliminating it as Camp Dodge in Minnesota, of course. <laughs> Camp Dodge, uh, they were about to throw them out of the town. They didn't see any value in having the base there. So one pay period, Camp Dodge paid all their people in $2 bills, and it's like a tracer. You ran uh, through every retail, every retail outlet in town was flooded with $2 bills, and all of a sudden they said, wow, they, they really do something. So that's, that's the reason the military went to pay with $2 bills. Yeah. To show, show the, the people around them that the military pays for the right, well, Now I'm going to change your thinking, so hold that idea, okay? Never throw an idea away, ever, ever. Everything changes every 15 minutes, so that idea you had 15 minutes ago is piece of crap then, it's going to be a great idea in 15 minutes. Do not ever, never, ever kill an idea. Okay, but I'm going to change your thinking a little bit. Think about, well, let's take a, the, the, the power oftentimes in your thinking is in the context. It's not just the fruit. You know, we always focus on what do I do, but it's, it's the bowl and it's the table. Zoom out. Zoom out. Whenever you think about that, that's Robbie in a sense. Where'd you go, Robbie? Right here. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. So, eyesight's failing me. Uh, when you zoom out, you get into a bigger context. And once you get into a bigger context, that's where the power is. That's where you find a lot of your great ideas. So I'm going to ask you to go out in a little bit, bit of a bigger context. Now, think about this. I am spending $2 bills, okay? I buy something in a store. I go, I go up and I pay for it. Who takes the money? The cashier. The cashier, okay. In the context, I'm going to ask you for now, focus your answers on this, if you will. In the context of cashier paying for stuff, why do I why do I carry two? Who's got an idea? Unless, Unless no, yeah. starts the conversation. Starts conversation, great. That started a conversation with us? Yeah. Okay, good. But it started a half a conversation? <laughs> okay. So why do I carry two? Disrupts the whole process. There is no Disrupt for twos. Ding, 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 ding. There are no slots in cash register drawers for two dollar bills. And I like to watch people make decisions. Okay? Can I borrow one of your twos? I'm pretty unreliable. Actually, it is my car, so I'd have to give it back to you. You know what? See that number on there? You can call me at that number. Yeah, like, really? Yeah. L O two six one five O six nine A. You can call me at that number. <laughs> you won't get me there, but you can call me there. <laughs> so when I hand somebody a two dollar bill, it reveals a lot about them when they're at the cash register. Why? Well mostly because I like to mess with people. <laughs> okay. But I'll give you an example. And, and how, how many of you, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to step aside for a second and I'm going to ask you a question. There, there are two things that I deal with. One is how to have a big idea, an unusual idea, one that's a killer idea. How do you amp up the power of your idea, which, which Robin was kind enough to talk about. Then there's another one, which is, and here's the paradox. The bigger your idea is, the harder it is to implement. Does that make sense? Yes. I call it the dark bulb. Okay, you know, light bulb's the symbol of an idea. You turn that idea around, every idea has a dark side, and the bigger an idea it is, the bigger a dark side it has. Why? Because every idea is born drowning. It has just as much wrong with it as it does right with it, and many ideas don't survive it. That's why it's good to look at the dark side of an idea. It, I get most of my ideas that score 
not because people couldn't think of them, it's just that they looked at them and there's too much wrong with them and they didn't want to do them. So here's my question. Are you more interested, should I focus on how to have a big idea or how to implement an idea? And it's about a model of who to go to and so, so forth and, and people's basic natures. So how to have an idea or how to implement an idea. So if you could raise your hands for one or the other, what's more important? How to have an idea, raise your hand. How to have a big idea. Okay, one, <laughs> two, all right. How to implement an idea. Okay, okay it's a tie. <laughs> both, I'm in the middle. Okay, how many of you want both no matter what? Okay, all right, good. Well, I'll, I'll make sure we handle the implementation part too. Because this is very important. This is, I've, I've taught, spoken around the world on this. Is you know what? There's a big problem, and, and, and here's the thing I want you to remember about this. Three words. People are different. Profound, isn't it? People are different. Well, duh. <laughs> so how are they different? When you hand them a $2 bill, you get four different basic natures from a cashier. Okay? And that, how people react unconsciously sometimes can tell you a lot about them. I had a $2 bill to a person called a creator. A creator, that's me. Is somebody, ideas are us, okay? <laughs> yeah, I love to solve problems, I love to come up with ideas, I love to do things that are different. I, the creator is behind the drawer, the cashier, and the drawer opens, hey, look at that, a $2 bill, man, I haven't seen one of these in about two years. In fact, I got a $2 bill in my wallet, I've had it for about, oh, yeah, two years, I guess. You know, I got, I'm gonna put a couple ones in the tip, then I'll, then I'll have two twos, isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a creator, okay, creator, is going to reject your idea. Do you know why? Because it's not my idea. <laughs> not invented here, it's called, okay? That's 35% of the people already saying no to your idea. Okay, now go to the opposite. Here's a person, this is my, this is my favorite person to hand a two dollar bill to. This is a person who's called an executor. An executor is great at maintaining the system, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. Great finisher, great implementer, right? So I'm, I'm an executor, I get, I'm the cashier, and I go. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Where am I going? Talk to Booth. I know what to do. I'm gonna go talk to the boss. There's gotta be a rule for this. <laughs> for creators, the first person love to break the rules, executors love to keep the rules. In fact, there was a, at an Arby's in Minneapolis, they uh, talked to each other, and. They called the police because they thought there was no such thing as a $2 bill. <laughs> <laughs> and then the cop thought the same thing and took him in, and finally the desk sergeant knew that there were $2 bills. <laughs> so people are indeed different, aren't they? Completely different reaction. Now, there's also a person called a refiner. What the executor and refiner have in common is they're both natural finishers. Uh, this is based on, have you heard about early adoption and late adoption yeah. marketing tool? Yeah. This is part of this model is based on that. So the late adopters are the refiners and the executors. Where executors like to keep the rules, refiners like to make the rules. So it's just a little bit different. Here's a refiner. You got something else? <laughs> so they don't even take it. The one person who ruins my fun is an advancer. Now, creator and advancer are the two early adopters. Creator's a thinker. Ideas per, you know, million ideas a minute. An advancer is, ooh, that's a great idea. No, I like number three better. You know, number three drives number five. Why don't we do number three first, then we'll do number five, and here we go. They're, they're the, the person they're gonna take your idea and run with it. I can get that done in two meetings. I got a little budget over here, okay? So, an advancer, I love advancers, because they run and get my ideas done. I hate them at the cash register. Why? <laughs> they ruin my fun. Here's an advancer. Hey, two dollar bill. Yeah. Ruin my day. So people are indeed different. Now, what does that what does that mean? By the way, the other thing I love about the two dollar bill. The only bill with people on it. You know what that is? Right. 
the signing of the, I, I call it the first dysfunctional meeting. <laughs> Why? Only a third of the people there were for the revolution. A third of the people wanted to stay with the British, and a third of the people just didn't want their names mentioned to anybody. <laughs> so, uh, so, what, when you look at these different people, <clears throat> it's like this. You're miscast, just like these idiots. Oprah Winfrey was fired from her job as a television reporter because she was unfit for TV. <laughs> what an idiot. Albert Einstein did not speak until he was four, did not read till he was seven. Total idiot. J.K. Rowling was on welfare, severely depressed, trying to raise a child on her own. Total, total idiot. You know, she's the one who sold uh, how many gazillion books with uh, Harry Potter. So, and it goes on. Winston Churchill, there's an idiot. He flunked sixth grade. Uh, Let's see, uh, we talked about, oh, Walt Disney. He was fired from his first job by a newspaper editor because the editor said, you'll never have a creative idea. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my favorite, the rocket scientist, Werner von Braun, the first head of NASA, took us to the moon. Uh, he failed ninth grade algebra, what an idiot. <laughs> so what's the point here? It's not that we're stupid, it's that we are in the wrong place because of the nature of work. If you heard this thing, well, it's your idea, so you finish it, you take it over. <laughs> what? <laughs> if I'm the kind of person who's gonna have the idea, I'm the last person who ought to finish it. You know, as a, as a uh, former client once said to me, he said, Fadden, if you were my lawyer, I'd be in the electric chair. <laughs> I, I think I should put that on my website. Don't you think? <laughs> Why is that? It was an out, I was in the ad business, it was an outdoor advertising campaign, and I spent all his money on creating and producing. It was a billboard campaign, and he had no money left to run it. <laughs> I spent all the money. So, yeah, we, are, uh, we are very good at certain things and just terrible at other things. I'll give you an example. You probably know this guy, right? Yeah. Although, if you're a Gen Y person or millennial, that's some old tall guy who plays golf. <laughs> but arguably, the greatest basketball player in history, okay? And so what did he do in the 90s? He's passionate about basketball, loves basketball, right? Also, just as passionate about baseball. Now, everybody tells you to, to be, do something you're passionate about. Well, you know what? That's not enough. It's also what part of me do I bring to it? Give me this example. Michael Jordan loves basketball. He's made for basketball. But he's also equally passionate about baseball. And what did he do? He failed at minor league baseball. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Played right field for the Birmingham Barons. Right field is where you play when you're the last one picked. <laughs> Look at this guy in his baseball. Now, does this guy look like a baseball player? It's like somebody photoshopped him. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a stick. He's got a strike zone that's like, uh, you know, maybe the size of uh, the Sears Tower. <laughs> so, how did he do? I actually watched him play in Memphis. He batted 202, struck out 114 times, and made 11 errors in right field. <laughs> No, that's not me. Okay, so uh, it's not just the content. It's the part of ourselves we bring forth. In other words, what part of Michael Jordan, he had his talents, worked in basketball, didn't work in this. I'll give you a quick example. I work with a lot of baseball teams. I'm a pure creator, right? Love baseball. Okay, so what's my perfect thing, my perfect work? is creating for baseball team, right? But I didn't know that. And so I did a lot of creating for banks. I hate it banks. Work. What's that? It didn't work out very well. No, it didn't work out well at all. Yeah, I, I invented derivatives. It was a terrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it was a good idea. Uh, but it was it was a dirt bolt. It had a lot of wrong with it. So uh, the problem is they had too many finishers. Too many finishers. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, but don't get me started on that because we're going to really go off. That's what creators do. We go off on tangents. So, uh, so I, I ran a uh, creative group inside a company. We grew it from $7 million in sales up to 29 dollars in one year after a layoff. 
because we were doing all this stuff, right? So I'm like, wow, I get to fly all my strengths and I'm having a great time. And we'd high five after, you know, we froze every competitor out of the business, but our clients were all banks. And I'd walk out of the room thinking, holy crap, I just did this to sell another checking account? What the hell's wrong with me? Okay, hated banks, loved doing the work, loved expressing myself as critic. The opposite, what if I went to work as a baseball team, I love baseball team, and they put me in the accounting department to pay my dues. You ever had to pay your dues? Yeah. Right, so you're, what are you gonna do? You're gonna do your weak work. When you do your weak work, it slows you down. What's the ideal situation? You gotta get a who to go to. You gotta build a team, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to a slide here. Gotta jump to a team, where you can actually do more with less. If I can work in my strength and hand off to the next strength, and to the next strength, and to the next strength, then we've got a team to get things done. Robbie's team, you know, great thinking. You know, you zoomed out in a couple ways. One is you, you also zoom from finishing signs to an opposite starting signs. Who starts the sign? Graphic designers are a big part of it. They, they make the sign happen. So great idea. Also, you've made a virtual team out of them. So one of the things you could do is make a distinction and do the handing off from person to person. Uh, so how does it feel to do more with less? That's how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do three things well, you will get 240 times of response. This is research by Doug Hall who wrote Jumpstart Your Marketing Brain. Three things that you do well. One, dramatic difference. Two, overt benefit. Three, reason to believe. And of the three, and I'll explain it in a moment, dramatic difference accounts for 55% of the 100% of the created by these two. So it's over half. That's how important it is to be different. Okay? Dramatic difference, how, how do I stand out from any competition? How can I be, how many of you heard of the book, book Blue Ocean Strategy? Okay, Renee Montborn and Chan Kim. They did some research. They found out they, they have a blue ocean is what's called uncontested market space. Okay? As compared to the red ocean. Contrast it with the red ocean, full of sharks, everybody's competing on price. Okay? You want to play in the blue ocean. Why? Because if you play in the blue ocean, and only 14% of the companies do, you will get 38% of the revenue and 61% of the profit. 14% of the companies get 38% of the revenue, 61% of the profit. How do you play in Blue Ocean? You do something that is different. I can show you how to do it. It's a, it's, uh, we don't create. Everything's already been created. You want to have a big idea? Combine. Take what you do and combine it with something opposite. Okay? If it doesn't fit, it's humor. This goes all the way back to Arthur Arthur Kessler and the act of creation. Combining it with something op uh, opposite. If they don't fuse, it's humor. If they do fuse, it's a big idea. Okay? So, I talked about uh, the dark bulb. Okay? Every idea is born drowning. Many people kill ideas because they have more wrong with them than they do right with them. What I'm saying to you is embrace those ideas, but then take them to a refiner, okay? So let's say, Ken, you're a refiner. I, here's, I got an idea. Blow every hole you can in this. You know about refiners? They immediately see the glass is half empty. They immediately can tell you what's going to go wrong. Creators and refiners get in fights all the time. Don't fight it. Reverse that and say, give me every, you know, do your worst. Oh, you can't do that. It's illegal in 18 states. Okay, and I'm trying for a national rollout. Is my idea dead? No. No, why not? 40 states, I can do it. I, I <laughs> love your thinking, hate your math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, 18 less. and 40 are... <laughs> I don't oh, want to go to Alaska. Oh, yeah, you said that's right. <laughs> Only the continental U.S., that's great. Yeah, it's legal in 32. Yeah. Why don't we launch in the 32 where it's already illegal, we'll get a track record, and then we'll lobby in the other states because laws change. Okay, so don't resist the objections to your idea. Embrace them, solve them, and what happens? Your idea gets even bigger. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a little bit of opposite thinking. 
I wrote this book, Innovation on Demand, and uh, I raised money for it. I spent money, did a lot of research. I spent all the money. Okay? So, can I put it on Amazon? No. Why? Because they take like half the money, right? I had to get 20 bucks for this book, or I'm in big trouble. What am I going to do? And all of a sudden it occurred to me, what if I use the methods in the book to market the book? Our concept. So I did, and I used an opposite. I said, okay, I zoomed out, and I said, where are books sold? Bookstores at the time, right? Yeah. Huge bookstores. What, what's obvious about bookstores? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more titles, right? Yeah. What's the opposite of that? No titles, right? But I couldn't figure out what to do with it. So I ticked it back and I made one title. All right, so here's bookstores, thousands of books. The opposite, one book. I started for my book, a one book bookstore. I got a thousand square feet in downtown Minneapolis. I put my book in 13 different departments. <laughs> Art, architecture, fiction and literature, psychology, self-help, sports, religion, business, and travel. <laughs> Only my book in each department. Uh, 5,000 copies of my book in this store. I called it Read Dundon, the bookstore that repeats <laughs> itself over and over again repetitively, tautologically, and, and redundantly. So, now, what is there about an opposite? The opposite of any commonly held belief is worth a fortune to someone. That's a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald. The opposite of a truth is not necessarily a falsehood. It's often an even greater truth. That's from Niels Bohr. Okay, He's, he ran the, uh, ran the atomic team. So, I use the opposite. Now, when you're doing an opposite, you know, so here are all the bookstores over here, right? And I do one opposite. They have a lot of titles. I have only one title. That's my opposite. Now, what I do is then I make sure I do everything else exactly the same as those bookstores. So, for example, they have great customer service, right? Okay, so I have great customer service too. If you are not completely satisfied with your book, it will be cheerfully exchanged for any other book in the store, your choice. <laughs> they have mottos, they have, they have logos, sayings and stuff, and so I had one too. More books? Hey, we like the one we have. <laughs> so what happened? On the strength of an idea, just the idea, I never made a phone call and I got in front of 50 million people. I sold 5,000 books and the unintended consequences, and by the way, unintended consequences are great. People walk into the bookstore and they look around and they say, hmm, you're crazy. <laughs> You want to come speak at my company? <laughs> like, cool. I get like a $5,000 speech just for being stupid. <laughs> Not a bad deal. It's like Weird Al Yankovic says, dare to be stupid. Okay? <clears throat> so what happened? So I got in People Magazine, 35 million readers. I got on the BBC. I got on ABC television. The first week, without making a call, I was on the, the late news on th uh, the three network stations. I got on the front pages of, of the Boston Globe, the uh, San Francisco Examiner, papers all over the place. Um, I don't know if you can see this sign. But here's the business section. It's, it's like a video store. The book's all faced outward. There's sports. And uh, this sign, I had a refiner executor running the store for me. And she says, you, says welcome shoplifters. <laughs> <laughs> she says, Al, you know, I've gone along with a lot of your crazy ideas, but we're not putting that sign up. Why not, Robin? Well, she's an executor, right? And she says, because they're going to come in here and steal you blind. I mean, it's obviously you've given them, obviously you've given them permission. And I said, so you want to know how to sell an idea to an executor? I said, I, first of all, I'll tell you what doesn't work. Logic. <laughs> yeah, that's the male thing, okay? You know, I, Stop. Shoplifters don't steal everything, Robin. Uh, maybe they'll buy a book. <laughs> yeah, so then I tried a motion. Okay? 
shoplifters have feeling too, feelings too. They don't feel welcome anywhere. She <laughs> 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 uh, was way too practical for that. She said, they're going to steal you blind. So I finally, uh, I finally learned it. And I said, I'll tell you what. Let's count all the books in the store. We'll measure. And uh, at the end, and let me have to sign up for one week. And if no books are stolen, I can have it up for another week. Fair enough? Yeah, yeah okay. I can live with that. So we counted the books. And we had to sign up for a week. End of week one, no book stole. So I got to have it up for another week. Okay? So we had it up another week. End of the week, counted up, no book stolen. Counted up for another week. Counted up, no book stolen. Uh, finally, the People Magazine article comes out and says, Robin says, you're going to get it now. <laughs> they're they're going to come in by the millions and steal you blind. And uh, so we counted the books again. Remember the agreement? No book stolen. And so fine, I had it up another week. No book stolen. Added up another week, no book stolen, but somebody stole the sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing I know that was, was stolen from the from the bookstore. So so what are we saying here? And that is if, if you've ever been in a meeting where it's one o'clock, two o'clock, three 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 o'clock. Like sort of suck your will to live. So you don't have to do that. And the meeting is just really symbolic of us working with other people, okay? You've got to get a who to go to, you got to get a who to go to, you got to get a who to go to. Creators hand off ideas to advancers. Uh, the woman I'm with is a creator advancer. I go out for a creative breakfast every morning at Starbucks in Gold River. I come back with 10 ideas. She says, number three is going to work, but you got to do number seven first. The rest of them park them over here. No, they're not for now, but do number three. You ought to add it into this. She helps me set priorities. To me, they're all the same. So uh, th then I go to the refiners and I say, What's, what can go wrong? What's the problem here? Now what we're sh talking about is, uh, you've seen all this, there's a diffusion of innovation, uh, innovators. So I'm, I'm the idiot who stood in line for eight hours to get the first iPhone, only to find out I paid too much. In other words, if people buy things early, early adopters of things, they're also early adopters of idea. Um, we also talk about, uh, Action, are you a right brain thinker or a left brain doer? If you're a right brain thinker, you're either a creator or a refiner. Most engineers are com combinations, creator, refiners. Uh, a lot of homegrown CEOs are that, have that profile as well. Left brain doers are advancers and executors. So we need us all. It's like a relay team, a handoff from creator to advancer to refiner to executor. Let me just show you a quick example of of how that paid off. I'm the guy who invented uh, the first satire. You ever seen those posters that say team and winning? Okay, I had this idea. To me as a creator, it's enough to have the idea. I had this idea to do a satire. This is like in the 90s, early 90s. Nobody had ever done this before. And uh, I hate it. I hate those posters. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, you're going to put a poster up and motivate me and leave me? Yeah, here, why don't you be motivated and then I won't have to talk to you. <laughs> so, so what does a creator do? I don't just hate him. I do a satire of them. And uh, so I, you probably can't read this. as give up. <laughs> you're a loser. No motivational crap's going to change that. <laughs> So for me, it was enough to have the idea. So I, I am trying to collect the entire set of advancers. And I go to my buddy, Mark Herman, and I say, Mark, what do you think about this? And he says, bad new idiot, give me that. And I, I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you're just going to sit on it, and I'm going to do something. And he faxed it to, remember fax machines? <laughs> well, that paper rolling up. So uh, he faxed it to Recycled Paper Products, who's like the number three card company. They faxed us back a five-year contract. They turned down a thousand ideas a week, and, and they have a hundred ten thousand outlets. And we went ka-ching, ka-ching, and of course, couldn't be a worse market. I encourage you to think. It looks like a great deal. Their only distribution. Soccer moms are not going to buy these, okay? Because it's more satirizing business. Well, we were totally wrong. Then, at the, in the meantime, three months later, Despair.com starts up, yeah. and they they admitted in a Fortune magazine article we were first, but they made all the money. So, uh, but one of the things we had 
Would you like to see some more of these? Okay, good. Uh, Never quit. That's motivational, isn't it? Never quit. Wait to be fired, you get more. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership. This is for all the people who put those on the wall. Leadership. You know it's you know it's there when no one puts crap like this on the walls. <laughs> Depression. Don't call in sick. Call in with a vague sense of doom. <laughs> Momentum. When you're circling the drain, you spin faster at the bottom. <laughs> now, for the this this one's more for the employed. Okay, to work for a corporation. Discovery. They finally called your references. Report to human resources. <laughs> now, here's the value of having an advancer. The refiners said, "Don't do this next one. It has a bad word in it." <laughs> It has a bad word in it. Don't do this one. Don't do it. And then, so Mark, who is the advancer, said, what do you care? You don't have any business anyway. You have nothing to lose. And it actually turned out to be our bestseller. So anybody who doesn't like bad words, please cover your ears now, okay? Uh, you ready? Do you want to hear it? Do you want to see it? Okay. Um, diversity. Black, white, gay, straight. You're still an asshole. <laughs> so my time is up. Thank you.